Hi, I'm GR. Welcome back to Player Base, a show dedicated to the study and analysis of ludology. Uh, and we are continuing our deep dive into the one D and D playtest material response questionnaire. And today, as promised, we're going to talk about Tie Fighters, uh, Tieflings. Sorry, and why are Tieflings important? <sighs> tieflings like the Dragon Mans came about as a standard race in fourth edition and they have proven to be very popular. And they've been and they've been very popular with a very specific subset of the population uh, apocryphally, uh, not apocryphally, sorry, anecdotally as I can as near as I can tell. And I'm about to tell you that anecdote. I have been onboarding people and, you know, people who bathe um, and uh, copulate relatively regularly, more so than me, uh, for the better part of 20 years now. One particular summer, 2016, I had a very bountiful crop that year, and there was one section of that summer where I onboarded four women and one very effeminate man who all of them, who had n never played any type of tabletop role-playing game before, many of them never played any kind of role-playing game or video game, they all wanted to be a tiefling warlock princess. Now, not every woman that I have played with and not every woman that I have onboarded onto the game has wanted to be a tiefling warlock princess. But in this particular instance, all of them wanted to do so. Why is this important? It's important for two reasons. One of them is that a lot of this material and the options that are the most novel or noticeable are toes in the water for WotC for them to create an avenue to make the game more welcoming and desirable for people who are not Caucasian white dudes, which is 75% of the player base still, right? And the 50 million people playing, 40 million of them look more or less like this. And they would like to change that, not only for reasons of inclusivity and altruism, but also because, you know, the Venn diagram of people who are nerds on the internet and who have heard about D&D, it's pretty much all purple, right? Like, there's not, you would be hard pressed to find someone who knows how HTML works, who has never heard of Dungeons and Dragons. Like, that is not, like, that's a friggin' unicorn, right? And they have the traditional shareholder model of, like, a cancerous cell, and they need to expand forever. Um, and there's really nowhere left to expand to in the realms that they already control. Um, <laughs> like, I thought, I mean, that's one of the issues with um, sort of like the capitalist uh, shareholder uh, avenue of, of developmental strategy is that it doesn't take into account or leave a lot of room for any type of lateral thinking on how and what is considered a healthy growth for a business. So, I mean, that's a problem that everybody has who speaks English, so let's not beat them up for that. But let's instead talk about what that means. What that means is, is if that if they want to expand their uh, player base, pun intended, um, and if they want to expand their market share, they have to create new market share. And in order to do that, they have to appeal to people who are not already, you know, heavily exposed or inculcated to, I don't know, being on YouTube listening to a guy talk about D&D &D rules, for instance. Like, you know, nobody <laughs> has watched this video because they were just scrolling, looking at, you know, people interpreting bell hooks. And then we're like, oh, this came up in my feed. That's not how it works. And if you are watching videos on interpretations of bell hooks, um, I forgot what I was going to say. No, I didn't. Uh, sorry. 
maybe uh, it's a uh, practice routine to disarm people. Maybe it's just the executive dysfunction from the neurodivergence. It's option B. Uh, tieflings are attractive to people with feminine anime for whatever reason. Uh, and I mean anime in the Jungian, not the weeaboo sense of the word. Now, I don't know for sure, um, but I can guarantee you that the retinue of um, corporate and child and ludological psychologists that Hasbro and Watsi have on retainer can figure this one out. Now, if I were to take a guess, I might venture into some sort of intuitive inference that the nature of a tiefling warlock princess being one of the leveraging the innate power and force of their own desire and desirability into a strength that they can then wield and manipulate to their defense and, and for it to be an asset and not only a liability, might have something to do with it. I mean, I don't know. You know what I mean? I'm not like a girl demon scientist or nothing, but that would be what I would assume for that one. And if you're wondering what that's in reference to, uh, because 75% of the population of people just like me I, I, full disclosure, I was embarrassingly late. I was 25 when I realized that. I was sitting on the subway, sitting in the, I'm not going to tell you about the subway. I'll leave the subway a bit out of it. But I just realized, I saw some woman on the other side, girl my age, and I was like, oh, man. Ah, right, of course. Like, if half the population were twice your size and constantly trying to fuck you, like, that would affect the way you interact with the world. Another good way of thinking about it is, and I've heard this one, and then I actually happened to be doing it uh, like later that week. Walk through a busy street with a cake in your hand and see how people interact with you. If you don't already know what it's like to be a woman, that'll give you a sense of it, right? You have, you are just carrying something that is materially desirable but highly vulnerable to assault, of all kinds and uh, malignment. And even if you, like, because, like, let's say you have the cake and someone starts, like, making jokes about wanting to touch the cake and you get aggressive with them, even if you win in a fight, the cake is ruined, right? Like, so if you're not familiar with that type, and this is, like, like I said, I am not, like, I, it's not the purview of the channel and I'm not, like, great at, uh, describing it within this context, but it gives you an idea of the kind of perspective that not you is coming from when looking at stuff like this. Because what's attractive to them and to their psyche and to their narrative, which is what I've been talking about throughout these whole um, series, uh, epi series is episodes, is, is that. If they're looking to attract more people, or if they're looking to make the avenue more inclusive, the answer is not to look for more plus ones or to make sure that people aren't like taking their plus twos and cheesing them. The answer is to give them the, the narrative infrastructure that they can place themselves in a story and that they have stories and the tool sets to build stories that allow those people in, right? And just having more bird people is not doing it, right? And some of that works. Like one of the reasons Spider-Man is the most popular superhero is because, you know, like Stanley used to say, anybody could be behind that mask, right? That's why people love Spider-Man even if they don't look like Peter Parker. Uh, funny story, I was actually living in Sunnyside, Queens when the first Spider-Man came out and they shot it like by the train station, you know? Like, that's, and like that's cool, but like loads of people who look more like Miles Morales than Peter Parker enjoy Spider-Man because it's easy for them to think of themselves as Spider-Man because of the full body suit, right? And that's probably why a lot of the offers that they're, that they're giving, like the animal-headed people, they probably have some kind of like readout saying, oh, but uh, people who are not like, you know, um, dudes who look like they maybe could have played rugby uh, if they applied themselves 
are playing these types of characters, but just because they don't have any other options. And with, with the tiefling, you know, people who embody and live their life within the multiplicity of the complexes of feminine power really respond to this racial class. And also uh, to this, Freudian slip, to this racial slash, um, combination character class. Race and class were the same thing in first edition, and I've made that Freudian slip slash pun a couple times. But yeah, like, you gotta... And it's also, it's tricky because, you know, they have people uh, of color, they have women on the Watsi team, but those are people who have already spent their lives developing a career playing role-playing games as it is. So that's not, re they're not accounting for a bias there, right? Like anybody, like here's the thing, I have played, I have run just about every single edition of Dungeons and & Dragons and, um, and I've run uh, Lovecraft and Cthulhu games and I've run um, so, uh, other science fiction games and I've rolled a whole bunch of shit you ain't never heard of <laughs> right like I am not the target market to be asking what my biases are for in, involving people who have not had exposure or desire to play the game before I can speak on it because of that bias and I have some minuscule level of self-awareness not much but some but they're struggling with that for reasons which are incredibly human and humane, right? The struggles that Watsi are having with this aren't, like, damnation worthy. It's just they're working within the paradigm, and the paradigm itself is getting to them. And just as an offshoot, if you are someone who looks like me and feels like this is too much in terms of what I'm talking about or in terms of what they're doing, like, understand two things. One, they're not getting rid of Elf with Sword, right? They're, like, if you want to just do, like, like white folks in 14th slash really 18th century, you know, England and France, you will be provided for. But the more challenging issue, which is something that is endemic in our culture all over the place, is, is giving not only people who are not, like, us narratives, but giving them bridges to connect those narratives to ours in ways that work and are not conflicting. Like that was the whole thing when I was talking about the the animal people. I showed it to my brother and he was like, uh, looks like you're you're ragging on furries. And that wasn't my point. My point was that like that's not that's not the answer to the problem they're trying to solve. Right? And I like maybe foolishly, wholeheartedly believe that there is a solution here where all of the weird outlier bits or that feel uncomfortable are not uncomfortable because people like me are being, or our narratives are necessarily being pushed out. It's because the actual syntax in the dialogue for including us with other narratives or including these narratives with the ones that we're more familiar with is not worked out yet. There's not a lot of like the vocabulary and the tenses and the conjugations of this language of integrating these things, no one's really done that before because that's not how language works usually. It's a, you know, it's a problem of language really more than anything else. And, you know, like as a like Caucasian dude who has run East Asian and West African like Tolkien style worlds, I can tell you, it's not as complicated or as troublesome as you might fear. Not at all, right? You know? Like the high elf from West Africa and the high elf from Western Europe can get together and make fun of the wood elf from like Asia Minor or Eastern Europe or East Africa. Like, you know, like <laughs> it's not, it's really not that complicated. Uh, and I can also tell you that if you are frustrated with just the some of the lack of engagement in some of the games that you're playing, a lot of times people say play other games. I'm going to tell you play with other people, right? So like another group of women, I had a, a group of all four women playing together, and they didn't have a lot of experience. One or two of them did. Um, out of the four women, they said it was Miranda. What does that mean? 
anyway, um, like playing with a bunch of women, particularly who have not played the game before, like just that, like they were Caucasian mostly. And that was interesting in ways that you would not necessarily expect. And I'm not speaking to, to, to women here. I'm speaking to people who have not played with women who might be a little apprehensive about inclusion, right? And this stuff, making the tools available so that people who are feminine or who are not Caucasian can engage with like masculine and Caucasian, uh, you know, a priori information here, synergetically. And that's important, not because it's necessary for a liberal utopia, it's important because the game is then richer and more fun to fucking play. And I can tell you that from experience. Man, like, and, and just from a Dungeon Master's perspective, I know this is a bit of a, but I think it's important to say, like from a Dungeon Master's perspective, being able, like the whole draw of being a good Dungeon Master is being able to couch your high fantasy or even low fantasy environment in the understanding and the preconceptions of the historical and mythological natural world that people already have. And so we get a lot out of just like doing that research. And so we're getting to do that, re that whole set of research for say like, like medieval Abyssinia, for instance. Fantastic. It's just fun to do, right? Like it'll give you so much more to work with. Um, and if you really want to get into the weeds because you really like tactics, you know, here's, here's, a, here's a free one. Um, many of the swords in Central Africa curve forward they're not sabers and the reason for that is so that they can clap over the edge of their shields which are essentially uh, like equivalent to different styles of western european shields and that's a tactical advantage so and you can work that into your game both narratively and tactically and strategically it's very interesting if you like that sort of thing which i mean if you're watching the video you obviously do so that's enough on that. Uh, the takeaway from this one is, um, you know, if Watsi and Hasbro were to invest some work into figuring out why um, feminine people really enjoy playing tiefling warlock princesses and give them more of that, we would be, it, like, it'd be a lot more fun to play for everybody. Um, worrying about the lore quality of the different subsets of tiefling magic spells Nobody gives a fuck about that. Nobody cares. You know, people who are going to complain or, or worry about that are already playing the game, and they're already going to buy the material you're going to put out if only to hate watch. You don't have to worry about them. But nobody who hasn't played the game before is bought or sold on the idea by like, oh yeah, I see that like when I follow this particular like fae or demon, I get like this spell set. It's not how, no. It, it, they'll, they'll get a sense of like, oh, this really gives me the sense that like I'm, I'm working for this particular demonic power or this particular fey enchantress. That they will respond to. But like, you know, the power equivalency, that's not the point. Anyway, uh, if you agree with me, tell me. If you think I missed something, uh, I think you might already be telling me. And if you hated everything that I said, I don't have to ask if you've already told me. Um, uh, thank you for hate watching. <laughs> And um, I'll see you in the next one. And if, you did, and if you liked it, I would also like to hear about that. Uh, and share this with people you think would like it or would hate it, people who are your friends, people who are your enemies. Press the little bell icon. I'm GR. This is player base, which is really discussing the nature of the mechanics of play, which is what ludology is. We will see you in the next video. Where we will be talking about the inspiration mechanic and also why no one really cares about feats. Bye.